Hello, my name is Juan Cunzayoroa, and I'm the co-founder of Polymath. Choosing the right air flow shape is an important step in drone design, as it will have a significant impact on the drone's performance and flight characteristics. So in this video series, I want to teach you practically everything you need to know about airflows, how they work, and how to select the best airflow for your next fixed wing aircraft design. So let's get started. In this first video, we will cover the theory behind how airfoils work. In the next video, we'll concentrate on providing practical guidance for selecting the most suitable airfoil designs. We'll start this first video by understanding the geometry of an airfoil. Then we'll look at how airfoils generate lift to sustain flight. Then we'll move on to study airfoil aerodynamics, including lift, drag and moment coefficients the stall and turbulence phenomena, and Reynolds effects. An airfoil is the two-dimensional cross-section of a wing. The geometry of an airfoil gives it its aerodynamic properties. An airfoil's geometry consists of its leading edge, the trailing edge, upper and lower surfaces. The chord line is an imaginary line between the leading and trailing edge. It helps us determine the orientation of the airfoil relative to the flow. The camber line is an imaginary line halfway between the upper and lower surfaces, which represents the average shape of the airfoil. It helps us visualize the curvature of the airfoil. There are three main metrics used to describe the geometry of an airfoil. The cord length is the total length of the cord line. It measures the size of the airfoil. The maximum camber is the maximum distance between the cord and camber lines. It is a measure of how curved the airfoil is. Note that some airfoils are symmetric and have zero camber, while others are curved. As we will see, camber is used to increase the lift capabilities of the airfoil. Finally, the maximum thickness is the maximum distance between the upper and lower surfaces. So how do airfoils generate lift to make aircraft fly? Although there is more than one valid explanation, here we will focus on one of the most intuitive ones, which relies on Bernoulli's principle. Take a look at how the air flows around an airfoil. Notice that the air bends up as it approaches the leading edge. As the air is forced to flow through a smaller area, it will speed up, kind of like when you close the nozzle on a water hose to spray water faster. Bernoulli's principle states that, assuming viscosity and gravity effects are negligible, the total energy of flow stays constant along the streamline. The total energy is composed of the energy contained in the fluid speed and the energy contained in its pressure. Therefore, if the flow speeds up, the pressure must go down. This means that the pressure above the airfoil is reduced as it speeds up. Notice the inverse happens below the airfoil. The flow is forced to pass over a larger area, making it slow down, increasing its pressure. Since there is more pressure below the airfoil than above it, there will be a net force upwards, which is the force that sustains flight. Consider an airfoil at an angle to an incoming flow. This angle, measured between the cord line and the flow direction, is called the angle of attack. The flow will generate a pressure distribution around the airfoil, which results in a single net force, which looks like this. It is convenient to break up this net force into two different forces, one which is parallel to the flow direction, which we call drag, and another perpendicular, which we call lift. The lift acts to sustain the aircraft's flight, while the drag represents the resistance to movement through the air. In aerodynamics, you don't usually deal with the lift and drag forces themselves, but with lift and drag coefficients. By dividing the lift force by one half times the air density times the flow velocity squared times the airfoil cord, you turn the lift into a dimensionless value called the lift coefficient. Since we are dividing by velocity and size, the lift coefficient captures the aerodynamic lift characteristics of the shape regardless of its size or the speed of the flow it is in, making it a more general and useful measure than the lift force itself. You can do the same with the drag force to obtain the drag coefficient. 
If we rearrange these equations, we can see that the lift and drag generated by an airfoil is proportional to the squared velocity and linearly proportional to the size of the airfoil and the air density. If you know the airfoil's force coefficients, you can simply plot it into these equations and obtain the aerodynamic forces for a specific flow density and velocity condition. Let's use SimNet to explore the lift and drag characteristics of typical airfoils. This is a typical plot for a symmetric airfoil's lift coefficient versus its angle of attack. Notice that increasing the angle of attack of the airfoil increases its lift. Also notice that since this airfoil is symmetric, it produces zero lift at zero angle of attack, and the lift curve is symmetric in negative and positive angle of attacks. Let's compare this to the lift coefficient curve of a cambered or non-symmetric airfoil. Notice that the cambered airfoil is able to produce lift even at zero angle of attack. Generally speaking, cambered airfoils are often capable of providing better lift performance, which is why camber is a common feature in airfoil design. This graph shows the relationship between the drag coefficient and angle of attack for a standard cambered airfoil. The drag reaches its lowest point at or close to a zero angle of attack and rises with an increase in the angle of attack in any direction. Usually we want an airfoil that maximizes the lift it provides per unit drag. Therefore, an important measure is the lift to drag ratio, which is also referred to as the aerodynamic efficiency. Here is a representative lift to drag ratio curve for an airfoil. The efficiency is maximum at a specific angle of attack. To obtain maximum range, the aircraft must fly keeping the wing near this angle of attack in order to minimize drag. Keep in mind that the actual aerodynamic efficiency of a wing be much lower than the airfoil's aerodynamic efficiency. This is because an airfoil is a two-dimensional geometry while a wing operates in a three-dimensional flow. As will be discussed in a later video, there are three-dimensional aerodynamic effects which introduce new sources of drag. Despite this, it's generally accurate to assume that airfoils with higher efficiency contribute to more efficient aircraft overall. Taking another look at the lift coefficient curve, you will notice that at a certain angle of attack, the lift starts dropping suddenly. This is known as the stall. When an airfoil's angle of attack increases too much, the flow will separate from the upper surface, causing what is called a stall. This will result in a sudden loss of lift and increase in drag, causing the aircraft to suddenly drop from the sky as demonstrated in this SimNet simulation. Therefore, the maximum lift achieved before stall and the stall angle of attack are major considerations when selecting an airfoil. Additionally, it's important to recognize that stall characteristics vary among airfoils. Some exhibit a steep decline in lift at stall, whereas others demonstrate a more gradual reduction. A gradual decrease in lift is generally preferred for its predictability during stall conditions. Rounded leading edges on airfoils usually result in more favorable stall characteristics than those with sharper leading edges at the cost of increased drag. Understanding the concept of turbulence is important to understanding airfoil performance and the stall phenomenon. When a flow touches a surface, it tends to stick to it. Therefore, the flow speed slows down to zero as it reaches the surface. This region of reduced flow speed near the airfoil surface is called the boundary layer. Since the flow sticks to the surface, it pulls it along, generating what is called skin friction drag on the airfoil. Initially, the flow within the boundary layer is smooth and orderly, a state known as laminar flow. As the flow progresses downstream, the boundary layer grows, and eventually it begins to disintegrate into many small vortices, marking the transition from laminar to turbulent flow. Turbulent flow causes an increase in friction drag against the surface. Airfoils with greater thickness possess a larger surface area, typically leading to higher skin friction drag. Moreover, surface imperfections or roughness can prematurely induce turbulence, further amplifying skin friction drag. However, there is also a benefit to turbulent flow. 
When flow is turbulent, it sticks more strongly to the surface, delaying flow separation. Therefore, although turbulence increases the skin friction drag, it can help reduce drag due to flow separation, which is called the pressure drag or form drag. For example, the dimples on a golf ball induce the flow to turn turbulent earlier, which increases the skin friction drag, but decreases the form drag by an even higher factor, thus reducing the overall drag of the ball. The Reynolds number is a dimensionless value that tells us how likely the flow is to turn turbulent. It relates the speed of the flow to the scale of the object and the viscosity of the fluid, which are the main factors affecting the onset of turbulence. Higher Reynolds numbers means turbulence is more predominant because the flow speed or object scale is large relative to the flow viscosity. We have seen how the lift and drag coefficients are a function of the angle of attack of the airfoil. Now we will see how they are also a function of the Reynolds number of the flow. Let's revisit the lift and drag coefficients of an airfoil, this time considering their dependency on the Reynolds number and angle of attack. In this plot, lines with higher Reynolds numbers are colored with a brighter shade of purple. We can see that higher Reynolds numbers tend to postpone the onset of stall to greater angles of attack and enable higher lift coefficients. Therefore, smaller airfoils are more susceptible to stalls, especially at low flow speeds, because of the lower Reynolds number. This is a plot of an airfoil's drag coefficient versus angle of attack and Reynolds number. The drag coefficient of the airfoil is generally reduced with higher Reynolds numbers because of the reduction in form drag. The increase in lift and reduction in drag results in a higher aerodynamic efficiency at higher Reynolds numbers, as shown in this lift to drag plot. Finally, let's talk about the moment coefficient. Airfoils don't only create linear forces, but they also create a rotational force, also called a torque or moment. For cambered airfoils, this moment is usually negative, meaning it wants to make the aircraft pitch down. Part of the purpose of the horizontal stabilizer on an aircraft is to create a downward force that counteracts this pitch down moment of the wing. This downward force acts against the lift of the wing and results in additional drag called trim drag. Airfoils with higher lift and camber usually also have greater pitching moments, requiring larger trim drag. Like the lift and drag, the moment is also expressed through the airfoil moment coefficient. This is how the moment coefficient looks for the Clark Y airfoil. Notice that it has a negative value over a large part of its angle of attack range, meaning it produces a pitch down moment. Unlike the lift and drag coefficients, the value of the moment coefficient varies depending on the point around which it is measured. It is customary to measure the moment coefficient around a point located along the cord line, one quarter of the way from the leading edge to the trailing edge of the airfoil. As a summary, the geometry of an airfoil can be described using the airfoil maximum thickness, maximum camber, and cord length. Airfoils produce lift by accelerating the flow above the airfoil and slowing down the flow below it, thus producing higher pressure below the airfoil than above according to Bernoulli's principle, which result in a net force which points mostly upward. The net force can be divided into two components, one force that is perpendicular to the flow direction, known as lift, which supports flight, and another force that is parallel to the flow direction, known as drag, which represents the resistance to movement through the flow. The ratio of lift to drag is known as the aerodynamic efficiency of the airfoil. It's more useful to represent aerodynamic forces as non-dimensional force coefficients, which capture the aerodynamics of the geometry independent of the flow speed and density. Airfoils also generate a moment or torque, which can be represented through a moment coefficient. Airfoils with higher camber tend to have higher moment coefficients, requiring more trim drag. The stall phenomenon happens when the airfoil angle of attack is high, causing the flow to separate from the upper surface and producing a sudden reduction in lift and increase in drag. Flow passing over a surface produces a boundary layer, which eventually turns the flow turbulent. 
Turbulence increases skin friction drag but delays flow separation, potentially reducing form drag and delaying stall to higher angles of attack. The Reynolds number is a value that captures how likely a flow is to be turbulent. Lift, drag and moment coefficients are a function not only of the airfoil's angle of attack but on the flow Reynolds number. Higher Reynolds numbers delay stall and increase airfoil aerodynamic efficiency. This video is brought to you by the Simnet cloud-based drone design and simulation solution. Thanks for joining me in this exploration of airfoil theory. Subscribe and stay tuned for our next video where we will dive into applying these principles to the design of fixed-wing aircraft.